Greetings, salutations, and words of goodwill. This is the second video in a series on early Christian heresies, but it is the first to cover an actual heresy, and the goal here is to start at the very beginning with the first heresy that appears in Christian history, in fact, it, and that is the ideas of a group of people who we refer to today as the Judaizers. In fact, the Judaizers appear so early in Christian history that the vast majority of St. Paul's epistles are actually spent dealing with their thoughts and ideas and attempting to counteract them. In fact, the questions that this particular heresy is attempting to answer and deal with are the topic of discussion at the very first major council of Christian leaders that we have recorded history of, namely the Council of Jerusalem, which takes place in Acts chapter 15. Nor should the emergence of this particular heresy very early on in the church be surprising to anyone, because the question which it essentially attempts to answer is, given the extensive historical, ritual, theological, customary, and legal apparatus that exists in Old Testament Judaism, how much of it actually needs to carry over into Christianity and the new dispensation that comes with the Messiah? And the answer that the Judaizers give to this question is essentially all of it, every last bit. If someone wants to become a Christian, then they must first convert to Old Testament Judaism, and then they can be admitted into the church. And not only must they convert to Old Testament Judaism, but in the process they must therefore follow all of the Old Testament rituals and laws that any observant Jew would follow. Now, this brings with it a number of issues, but uh, three which really seem to crop up from a practical standpoint. The first, although perhaps the least problematic of these, is all of the various dietary requirements which Jews have to meet in order to follow their religion. No pork, no shellfish, no mixing dairy and meat, that sort of thing. The second, which is a little bit more problematic, is that Judaism is not merely a religion or a set of ideas, but it is in fact an ethnicity. And when one converts to Judaism, at least Old Testament Judaism, in a proper sense, one leaves one's old ethnicity behind. It's entirely possible to be Irish and become Muslim and still remain Irish, or to become Buddhist and still remain Irish. But when one becomes a Jew, in a very important sense, one really does cease to be Irish. One doesn't just leave one's old religion behind, but one leaves one's own ethnicity behind, one's people behind, and becomes part of a new ethnic group, namely that of Judaism. Um, and needless to say, some people were very interested in Christianity as a religion, but were a little bit hesitant to say, abandon their entire nation. But some people could even get over that. But then, of course, there is the third big issue, and that's the whole cutting off part of your penis thing. Most Jews receive circumcision at eight days old and have no say in the matter and have uh, no memories of it. And I'm not trying to criticize the practice itself. It's just simply a matter of fact that if you went to a 30-year-old man who was uncircumcised and said that you really wanted to cut off part of his foreskin, he would probably be very reluctant to be involved in whatever activity necessitates that. The man who opposed this position, that people must first convert to Old Testament Judaism and follow all of its rituals and customs, was none other than St. Paul, who because of this ended up gaining the title the Apostle to the Gentiles, and also who wrote vast swaths of the New Testament. In order to understand St. Paul's opposition to the Judaizers, one first has to understand that the Old Testament law of the Jews can be broken up essentially into three categories. The first of these is the moral law, the second of these is the ritual law, and the third of these is civil law. Moral law essentially tells us right from wrong. This is what you have to do to be a good person. This is what you have to do to be a bad person. An example of a moral law would be, you shall not steal. And the question of why you shall not steal is not so much, well, because it's illegal, as much as it is because stealing's bad, okay? 
ritual law unsurprisingly describes the particular actions that Jews must partake in or must refrain from partaking in in order to practice the rites of their religion, in order to pray and worship, etc., etc. So, for example, in Judaism, the fact that Passover begins on the 15th of Nisan or that Passover should be celebrated at all is an example of a ritual law. In Christianity, the fact that Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays, especially during Lent, or that Christmas falls on the 25th of December. These particular rules might promote moral behavior by promoting religious activities, but there's nothing inherently moral or immoral about them. Passover could just as easily start on the 16th of Nisan and serve the same purpose, and Catholics could just as easily give up dairy on Fridays instead of meat. It just so happens that if you're going to be practicing a particular religion, or practicing religion at all, you're going to need some activities that you engage in, and it's probably a good idea to regulate that personally, and especially if you're doing it as a group, so that everyone's doing the same thing and not just random stuff on their own. Civil laws describe the practicalities of how a country is run. We can't forget that when God created the Jewish nation in the Old Testament, he was creating a nation, and nations have rules and regulations. Some of these correspond pretty much directly to the moral law, like stealing is illegal, both in most countries today, I imagine, as well as in the Old Testament. But some of them merely promote or enable the moral law. So, for example, according to Exodus 22, if a man steals a, an ox and he gets caught with the ox still in his possession, alive and fine, then not only must he give back the ox, but he must also give back a second ox as repayment. Whereas, under the laws of my home state of Indiana, a similar theft lands you in prison for six months to two and a half years, or possibly fined upwards of $10,000. Punishments are obviously not the same, and yet, in essence, the purpose of them is the same. The purpose of both of them is to keep people from stealing. Another good example of the civil law, which is even less directly related to the moral law, is that in most countries, when you're driving, you stop when you come to a red light. That's prescribed by statute, and it ought to be, because the moral law would dictate that one ought to operate heavy machinery in a safe and reasonable manner. And if more than one person were to come to an intersection at the same time, and they didn't know when to stop, this would result in that not happening. Does it matter that the light is red necessarily? Could it be orange or purple or even green for that matter? Sure, but there needs to be a rule that everybody knows so that we know when to not get hit by other cars. Now, St. Paul's position is essentially that Christians should obviously be required to continue to keep the moral law. But they are no longer required to keep Jewish ritual laws, or especially Jewish civil laws. The purpose of those laws is to teach the truths of the faith and or the moral law, and also to promote the keeping of the moral law. But one shouldn't assume that such regulations will need to be, or even ought to be, the same in every place, situation, and time. Different peoples or different groups of peoples might need different rituals in order to actively and appropriately worship God. They might need different civil laws in order to promote morality. And especially those civil laws might need to change and develop over time because, for example, Moses didn't have automobiles. So the people of God are going to need alternative laws in order to deal with that amazingly new situation. And while certainly the Judaizers being a rather large and multifarious movement, had individuals with different reasons for believing the Old Testament law needed to be kept, St. Paul's primary opinion of their position is essentially that they are convinced that, that their rituals and customs are not only the only way, but the essential way to reach moral perfection, and that, in fact, they, over and above the grace of Christ, are actually sufficient to result in that moral perfection. And St. Paul is very much opposed to both of these ideas. 
namely that Christians are going to be bound by the civil laws of, and ritual laws of the Old Testament forever, never to be changed or altered, and that people are capable of reaching salvation of their own power or simply by following some sort of special regimen or methodology, the way that one might be able to lose weight with the right ratio of diet and exercise. And so it's those two ideas that the Christian church following the New Testament ultimately rejects. With their theology having been described, it would be beneficial to close out this particular video by going over the history and lead up to that council I talked about earlier, which is described in Acts 15, the Council of Jerusalem. Suffice it to say that when St. Paul and Barnabas went out teaching, when they showed up in a particular town, they first attempted to preach to the Jews there and weren't always successful. And so not being successful, they then turned to the Gentiles and tried to preach salvation in the coming of the Messiah to them. And when converting Gentiles to Christianity because of this theological position relating to the way the Old Testament law was going to function in the Christian church, St. Paul did not require of them following the dietary laws or other customs of the Old Testament, uh, necessarily keeping Jewish holidays rejecting their current nationality, although becoming part of the Christian church has always entailed sort of a turning and being committed to a new people. And finally, he didn't require circumcision because that would have been a really tough sale, and St. Paul didn't think it was in any way necessary. Then what would happen is that St. Paul and Barnabas, having established a church and, and created some clergy in the area and gotten them going, would move on to another city and start the process over again. You know, and then give it a few months or maybe a year or whatever. And then eventually what would happen is that a group of new missionaries would arrive in town, which is not necessarily a problem. It's probably a good thing. But these particular missionaries would be Judaizers, and they'd find the Gentile church there and perhaps be very excited that they had come to believe in Jesus, but then explain to them that it was necessary for them to follow the laws of the Old Testament, many of which they didn't necessarily know. And so they would tell them, you know, that you have to stop eating pork. And maybe you could convince most people to do that. And then you tell all the men that they need to ritually cut off part of their penis. And they're immediately going, wait, I didn't know I was signing up for that. And so, of course, they write letters to Paul, and they're like, Paul, these guys showed up, and uh, they're saying we got all these things, and this is why St. Paul is always f focusing on circumcision in many of his letters, because, you know, they don't want to do that. And uh, St. Paul would write them back and say, no, you don't have to do any of those things. And then the people were getting very confused. And so um, after St. Paul's first missionary journey, uh, when he and Barnabas returned to Jerusalem, you've got the Judaizers relatively pissed off at him because he's telling all the Gentiles they don't have to become Jews. And the Judaizers think that's, you know, not true. And St. Paul's upset with the Judaizers because he keeps setting up these churches and then they show up and like throw everything into a tizzy because they're talking about genital surgeries. And uh, so they decide that they need to have a meeting and they need to talk. And basically, what happens is that Paul and Barnabas tell them all the success that they're having amongst the Gentiles, and some of the Judaizers say, but you're not making them become Jews. And Paul was like, I know. And uh, the leaders of the church, which are called in this passage the apostles and the elders, elders here uh, being the Greek word presbyteroi, meaning, meaning elders in the same way that certain people in municipalities in the United States are called aldermen, so it's a official position in the church, um, and would typically be translated from Greek contemporaneously as priest, although in this time period it's entirely reasonable that it could perhaps also refer to bishops, start debating the matter amongst themselves. And then what happens is that Peter stands up, who Catholics at least understand to be the first pope, and was obviously a leader a very significant leader in the early church, and he says that he thinks Paul and Barnabas are right, and that if the Holy Spirit is coming upon these people, then who are they to question what God is doing and insist that they convert to Judaism? 
I mean, everybody seems to think, well, Peter said it, so that's a pretty good reason to just shut up and move on. But then, of course, something really strange happens, and that's that St. James the Lesser stands up, who happens to be the leader of the local church in Jerusalem, per se. And he seems to say, now hold on, guys, let's not go too far ahead of ourselves. At the very least, we should tell them that they need to stay committed to the laws in the Old Testament, which were given to everyone and not merely Jews. Um, while the list is not exactly the same, essentially you could understand him as saying they need to follow the Noahide laws. And it's very interesting that that's the position that the council takes. And, and so what we see in the book of Acts is that the position the church takes is practically speaking in favor of Paul because the Gentiles don't have to do most of the ritual and civil requirements in the Old Testament, leaving them free to uh, govern themselves uh, contemporaneously as Paul would like them to. But the theology that the council takes is actually contrary to Paul, because essentially what they've said is not that the ritual and civil laws of the Old Testament are no longer binding because we're under some sort of new dispensation from Jesus, and now that the Messiah has come, we are free to seek moral perfection and not merely restrain ourselves from very serious culture and society destroying sins by keeping the laws of the Old Testament, but that all of those laws are still binding uh, on anyone to whom they were promulgated to, and it's simply the fact that the Gentiles never had them promulgated to them, and so they happen to not have to follow them. And that's very interesting, and we ought to actually draw two very important conclusions from that. Um, the first of these is that the outcome of councils of the church when relating to heresies or theology generally is typically one of compromise that you have one side which comes into an argument with one position, and you have another side which comes into the argument with the opposite position, and that the goal of the council is not typically, although it can, to simply have one side trounce the other side, throw them out of the church, uh, but rather for the two sides to come together and say, okay, what is it that we can both live with and stay in communion? And in the case of Paul and the Judaizers, the Judaizers were able to be convinced of something which allowed Paul to practically continue his missionary work amongst the Gentiles with virtually uh, no hindrance without requiring them to necessarily accept his theology, which we have to remember is the theology of the New Testament and the, 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 the theology of God, and as a result of that, true. Um, and so we have to realize that when it comes to dealing with heretics, this is often how the church functions. The second thing to notice is that St. James is the one who sort of puts the brakes on the complete triumph of St. Paul's not only practical concerns, but his theology itself. And so it's not unreasonable to conclude that St. James himself, who is called the brother of Jesus, whatever exactly that means, and who is the leader of the church in Jerusalem, which is the holiest city in the world, and is one of the apostles, etc., etc., uh, he indeed seems to have been a Judaizer of some stripe or another. And this is important because... We have a tendency to think of heretics as the bad guys, the other, um, that somehow that they immediately, in their act of heresy, separate themselves um, in a very visible and institutional manner from the church. And that's simply not the case. The reality is that uh, many heretics in the sense that we're using it here, remain a part of the church, and one might say an even vital part of the church, who are simply confused or mistaken 
about what exactly it is the teaching of God is. Sometimes they hold very high positions, and sometimes they're doing very good, important, necessary work. Sometimes, in fact, they're saints. Um, and, in fact, probably many times they are us. Because the chances of us completely understanding as well as we could and as well as we could articulate the teachings of Christ are highly unlikely. Um, and so we should keep that in mind when forming our own ecclesiologies and when determining how we interpret the activities of heretics in the past and also how it is that we experience their behavior in the present. So that's all I really have to say about the Judaizers um, in this particular video, other than to add that there was another group of uh, heretical individuals known as the Ebionites, who happened to be Judaizers of a strand. And people have a tendency of simply conflating the two movements completely, and that's not fair. Um, I'm not going to discuss the Ebionites in any video, at least I don't have any plans to at the moment, but they had some other ideas which uh, pertained to Christ's divinity, etc., etc. Um, so I should just mention that I see no reason to believe that the Judaizers, which are mentioned in the earliest uh, books of Christian history, namely those in the New Testament, are always Ebionites. So anyway, that's all I got. So please like, comment, subscribe, etc., etc. And until next time, God bless and have a great day.